Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Let's just pray for a moment. Father, we thank you today for your goodness, your grace, the privilege we have of gathering together as an assembly to be a part of a work of ministry that is designed to exalt your Son and our Savior, to proclaim your word so that he is honored. And we just thank you for the privilege of it. And as we look into these passages today, we pray these things might impact our lives and our thinking the way you've designed them to. In Christ's name, amen. I've tried to say to you last time in verse number 10, last two times, when he says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Our strength, our, our, our internal capacity to endure is found in God's grace to us. Be strong in the Lord and in the grace that God's given to you in Christ. That's not be strong by the Lord in the sense that he comes and empowers you. It's your strength is in who he's made you in Christ and in the, the power of his might. That's chapter 1. And it's always struck me that that verse seems to sort of outline chapter 1. The first half talks about who God's made you in Christ. second half talks about the glorious program that the Father of glory has designed to exalt his Son. You know, when you, when you get a hold of the idea that God the Father has this cosmic plan to make his Son the center of everything in the universe, there's a, there's a spectacular understanding about that. God the Father, has, he's got this... If I say it this way, you'll be kind to me and not, not think I'm blaspheming. But it's sort of like he has this hallucination that if you could see in his son everything he sees in him, you'd be as thrilled about him as he is. You'd love him the way he does. You'd value him. You'd cherish him the way the Father. In Christ, Colossians 1 says he, he, that, he, that, that he, God the Father has made all preeminence dwell in him. And that's not a while fanciful hallucination, that's a reality. And the Father understands that, and that's why he holds him. That's why it's not a, you're not an autotron that it's, you're forced to do something. That's where he sets something in front of you that is so fantastic that if you really looked at it and really saw it, little Charlotte sang that song at the conference in Ohio, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And that's really the attitude that God the Father has about his Son. And because of God's provision of grace for us, and that future glorification of his Son that we're going to be a part of, the adversary hates that. He hates that truth because he's opposed to it. He wants that position. So he says in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You see, Satan and his kingdom of darkness, his kingdom of obfuscating what God's doing, his chief aim in the midst of all this is to, to hide the truth of God's grace, to distort the message of grace today, to adulterate it, to neutralize it. He doesn't want you to be able to stand and when I read that, you know, he's going to talk about wrestling and stuff. But the whole issue is just to stand your ground. You don't have to go take ground. You stand in ground that Christ has already given to you. And then he says, put on the whole armor of God. The what is be strong in the Lord. The how to be strong in the Lord is put on the whole armor of God. The why is that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So you've got all three of those things there. And we're going to spend some time studying and looking at those in some detail. I just This morning, I just want you to see something about the challenge of that. Because when he says, be strong in the Lord, and when he says, stand against the wiles of the devil, verse, 10, verse uh, 11, Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. When you withstand something, you, 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 you don't let the pressure throw you over. You're able to stand against the pressure that comes against you to try to knock you over that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stay right where God put you, 
and his son. All of that calls for courage. It calls for the capacity to take the dare of faith to stand where God puts you and to have the courage to stand against the opposition that comes from the world, your flesh, and the satanic forces that seek to bring all of those things to push you away from who you are in Christ. Now, that's not, in the world you and I live in, you look around you and see all this goofy stuff going on in the world. It's goofy, but it's not unexpected. The opposition, you know, in our culture today, and I've said this to you many times in in the last decade, the, the moral, ethical bumpers that have kind of been, you know, the curbs in which society's kind of bounced back and forth, they've been eliminated. And now culture just rolls off into the fields of, 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 of the quicksand and the mire without them. When I say that, just the ability to identify, for example, the thing about marriage. Our legislature in, in this state just passed laws to tell you that, that, a, that a baby that's born can be murdered if the mother doesn't want to have the baby after she's had the baby. And you have, you, you have the, 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 the abortion stuff. That's not even killing the baby in the womb. The partial birth bo- abortion is the baby's basically born. And then you, you say, well, where did, where, did, where did you get to that kind of a place in life? You know, listen, if you want to have control over your body, have it at the getting, not just at the having. You understand that? He said, we want control. Well, you've got control, but once you've done something, everything that you do, every action has a consequence. And the consequences aren't controlling over your body. You already gave up control of your body at the having, at the getting, rather. So you say, well, where does that come? All that, those, those, those ethical things that give you the ability to understand why that's a bad thing, our culture has ejected those things. So when you, when you live in the world we live in, the world, listen, you need to be reminded, you need to remember that it's always been this way. This is not something new. The world, the satanic program that controls the world, has always been opposed to what God's doing. It's always been opposed to the the, the, the structures that God has placed in his world to give life and, 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 and human life the capacity to function properly. We've studied through Ephesians 5 repeatedly. I've gone back to Genesis with you and talked to you about those four divine institutions that God established for the orderly maintenance of society. If you want to have a strong nation, a strong culture, a strong life, there's volition, marriage, family, and nationalism, those four things. And that's why he talks in chapter 5, verse 18 and following about being filled with the Spirit. That's your individual volition. Then he talks about wives and husbands. There's the marriage. Then he talks about children and fathers. There's the family. Then he talks about servants and masters. There's the world out there. And this, this social order that, that a, a, a Spirit-filled believer, someone whose life is under the control of God's Word, should live in and function in. And he gives you practical instructions about that. Now he's going to talk about the opposition. Listen, in Isaiah 14, I'm just reminding you now, you, you, everybody says, I understand that, Brother Rick, move on. <laughs> You'll remember in Isaiah 14, I'm sure, where he talks about Lucifer, son of the morning, and the original plan the adversary had. And he describes him as the one who d- does weaken the nation. How does he weaken the nations? His design is to eliminate, to weaken, to neutralize those institutions that God has placed in the culture to make the world function God's way. Make sense? Here, he's talking about all facing all. None of this is new. It's always been the the adversary's plan to do that. Go back with me to Acts chapter 3. In facing all of that, and I, you know, for me... Personally, the issue isn't so much looking around and trying to identify all that stuff. We, we were at the, when Cynthia and I were out in Pennsylvania after the Ohio meeting, we, we stopped at the Flight 93 
Memorial in, in, in uh, Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And that's, one, that's the flight that Todd Beamer was on and that, that, that landed in the field there. And every time I've talked to somebody about that, somebody here says, oh, well, you know, we really believe the Air Force shot that plane down. And there's a conspiracy theory about all that. And it's, it's interesting when you go through that memorial, they actually have the cockpit conversation between the terrorists. Came off the black box. And in that cockpit recording, they play it for you, you can hear the passengers beating on the door. They've taken over, they got, got rid of the, the, the terrorists back here, and they're beating down the door into the cockpit. And you can hear the terrorists in the cockpit, talk, they, they, in English and in Arabic, talking to one another, and in essence saying they're going to break through, the passengers are, down it. And they say, put it in the ground. So if, if it got shot down, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't show up in any of that. The reason the thing crashed is because the passengers were going to break through and the terrorists were going to go, and they crashed the thing into that field there. By the way, it's quite an impressive, quite an interesting, a humbling uh, memorial to go to and to see that. If you ever get a chance to go out that way, it's off the beaten path, but it's, it's certainly worth seeing. But you see that, and everybody's worried about why did it happen, how did it happen. Uh, to me, it happened. Trying to figure out all the whys and wherefores isn't as important to me as how do you respond to it? And where do you get the internal fortitude in face of the opposition, no matter where it comes? Listen, I don't care if I understand all the details of how it happened. I know what's going on. I know there are forces in the world of evil and darkness. The question is, how do I respond to it? And understand, if you, say, well, if you don't understand all that stuff, you don't know how to fight it. No, in the Scripture, the way you fight it isn't with guns and missiles and NASA. The way you fight it is with truth. By putting that truth in your heart, your understanding, putting it in your family, putting it in your siblings, and standing for it. Opposition to what God's doing isn't anything new. That's what I'm trying to get at. This stuff he's going to talk about here, this is the, it's the great details about how to, how to handle these things is important. It's how you respond to it. And it takes courage to do that. It takes some internal fortitude to just relax and say what God says is true no matter what I see. In Acts chapter 3, the Lord Jesus Christ has come. He's presented himself. Israel has rejected him. He's died. He's been resurrected. He's ascended into heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit back. And Israel is facing a wonderful opportunity to repent and receive her Messiah. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Now, he's not a modern-day preacher, I guess. You know, they had a thing on TV two weeks ago about uh, uh, Kenneth Copeland down in Texas, the, 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 the TV prosperity preacher. And uh, one of the TV magazines caught him in, the, in kind of an off-guard moment to ask him to explain why he needed a new, what is it, $80 million airplane. And, you know, I, <laughs> you think, ooh, that's, you know, Jesse Dupree takes you down his hallway and says, I've had four, God's given me four planes and, he shows you each one of them, and hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, I fly a lot. I'm a, I'm a, I, I've flown a 1.8 million miles on American Airlines alone in the last number of years, 400,000 miles on Delta, about 150 on United. I don't like United, but sometimes you, you have to do it. So I know, but you know where I fly? I fly in coach. <laughs> you know why you fly in coach? Well, it's, it's a whole lot more affordable. 
And you know what? You get there just the same. I've, I've been in first class, got bumped up to first class on occasions and so forth. And you know what? You get a little hot thing of peanuts and, and you, get, you, get, you get the opportunity to have all the booze you want to have, which I want that. And then you get the opportunity to have a little, have a little cardboard meal. And first time that ever happened, I, they had little salt and pepper shakers and I brought them home. I said, I'll show these to my wife. And she scolded me for stealing them. I said, I didn't steal them. They gave them to me. I asked the lady for them. She said, sure, we're just going to throw them away anyway. So I, but, you know, first class is, but, you know, when the flight's over and you're there, it's over. When you sit in the back and the flight's there, that's over. The only thing you don't want to be is in the middle seat between two, you know, oversized people. But other than that, it's, it's okay. And people say, well, I couldn't do 65% of what I do if I didn't have that airplane. No. Pete says, silver and gold have I. You know why Peter didn't have any money? Matthew chapter 10, when Christ commissioned him, he says, when you go, don't take any money with you. Don't take any. Different kind of world. People claim these passages, the healing here, and yet they don't do what's there. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the, by the hand, by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. I've been saying to you in the book of Mark, as we're studying Wednesday night, these are not recoveries, these are restorations. In the Bible, healing is not, I'm going to take six months and get well. Okay? It's immediate restoration. It's not, I'm going to just recover from being ill. We pray for people that are sick, and you say, people pray, Lord, heal them. And what they mean is, help them recover from the problem. That's not healing in the Bible. This guy was lame for 40 years from his mother's womb, and the text will tell you later, he's 40 years old. And they give him instant restoration in his, in his ankle bones. And he, leaping up, stood and walked. Do you understand how amazing that is? You take someone in, that's been laying down for a long time, and they get where they can go. My, my son David, when he was 18 months old, he spent a couple of weeks in the hospital in, in basically a, a coma. And when he, when he regained confidence, we didn't know if he was going to live, die, be paralyzed, what was going to happen to him. And when he began to recover, every day they had taken a spinal tap on him and came and, and I would hold him and they would, but he, they would take a spinal fluid. He laid there and let them do it because he was just basically comatose. The day I knew he was going to be okay is I'm holding him, and they came at him with that needle, and he climbed over my shoulder. <laughs> Whoa, I'm getting out of here. Because <laughs> he was able to go. But you know, it took him a week to learn to walk again. We'd walk him around, put him in a, in a wheelchair, tie him in, and walk him around. You know that. I had heart surgery. And after I had the surgery, you're recovering, and it took... I mean, they had physical therapists coming in there teaching me to walk with a walker and stuff. He said, I feel like I'm 90 years old. But you know what? You needed that for a couple of days. This guy instantly cannot just walk. He can leap. See, that's restoration. That's not just take, take 12 weeks of physical therapy to get better. This is healing in the Bible sense. Leaping and stood up, walked, entered in with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now you talk about having a hoot nanny. He's having it. Why? <laughs> I'm restored. Here's a guy who never walked in his life. Instantly can walk. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was him which sat at alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as a lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's great, great, Greatly Wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered and said, and he begins to preach to them. Now after he's preached to them, chapter 4, 
the reaction to the guy getting healed and the reaction to Peter talking about what that healing means in, in the rest of that chapter, chapter 4, and as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees, uh-oh, here's a bunch of killjoys. Here's the religious leaders of the nation. Here's the governmental officials of the culture. They came unto them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Imagine that. Now, they're mad at the apostles for preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ who just healed this guy. And they laid hands on them and put them in, in, in hold unto the next day, for it was now even time. So now they go out and they arrest them. They put them in the huskal. Verse 5, it came to pass in the morning that, that, that their elders and rulers, their, their rulers and elders, rather, and scribes, and, An and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas and John and, and Alexander. You ever want to get your name in the newspaper? How would you like to have your name in the Bible in this context? You know, I imagine these guys, before it was over with, wish nobody knew who they were. Here they are 2,000 years later, right there in the book. And as many as were of the, the kindred of the high priest, nepotism, were gathered. You see how, how corrupt things have gotten in Israel? And uh, were gathered together at Jerusalem, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power, by what authority, by what right, or by what name have you done this? So they're going to interrogate them. Well, Pete says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, you rulers of the people and, rulers of, and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done unto the impotent man, by which means he is made whole, be it known unto you, you all, good southern guy, and all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which the, was set at naught, of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. You see how he's driving the point home? That's called conviction. Now, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, when they saw, watch, the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. When they saw the boldness, you see, when Peter did all that, he wasn't worrying about his own safety at all. The dude's in jail. And he comes out to the people who put him in jail, and he boldly, courageously, not worried about his own safety. Verse 17, But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightway threaten them. Now here's the solution that, that the leaders had. Let's threaten them that they speak not henceforth, to, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak in the name nor teach in the name of Jesus we're giving you an official governmental sanction. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge you. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, <laughs> I mean, have you ever been threatened? Have you ever had the government come and say, You do that, I'm going to take your stuff. That's what they're doing. Finding nothing how they, they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was about 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. It wasn't a fake. It was a real thing. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported to all, the, all, all that the chief priests and elders said unto them, 
And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Okay, Lord, we're glad we escaped. Let's don't do anything else. No. Verse number 29, they're praying. Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that which that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and, and that signs and wonders may be done in the name of, of thy holy child. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. You see, the situation call for boldness. It called for some people to be have the courage to speak forth God's word, and they did. And what, what did they do in the face of opposition? They said, we're going to boldly proclaim God's truth because it's what's true no matter what the reaction. Now, you know what happened with the nation of Israel. Come on, chapter 13. What happened with the nation of Israel, subsequent to that is, that they went on in their blind rebellion. God stoops down and saves the leader of that rebellion. Saul makes him Paul the apostle and sends him out to offer salvation to individuals everywhere simply on the merits of the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first time Paul preaches and that's recorded in the book of Acts is Acts 13, verse number 38. Acts 13, 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe. Not just Israel. He's in the synagogue in Antioch here. And he goes in there and he talks about, I'm talking to you Israelis in here, and I'm talking to you about someone who can, verse 39, he says, by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. Your program, your law system, your religion isn't enough. He's not in there confirming Israel in their unbelief. He's in there rebuking Israel for their failure. And it says, the Lord Jesus Christ that you took and crucified, God's raised him up. It's through what he did that everybody, not just you, everybody. This is so different from what Israel had been hearing in the prophetic program, Gentile salvation was to be done through Israel. Here Paul says, no, God's changed all that. Verse number 43, this is, this, this is a hoot. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together. All the Gentiles come together to hear the Word of God. They say, you know, when we were years ago, Nick Trzyski, Oscar, and I went to Bulgaria, and Nick and Helen wanted to get the gospel back to their family. So we spent three weeks in Bulgaria sharing the gospel. It's the most fascinating thing I ever experienced in my ministry where people just open wanting to hear. They'd been just two years after the communist government had fallen, and people were open everywhere to hear the God. We'd get a group. We'd go. We went to Nick's hometown, Sirokido, and his family went out and got everybody in the town into their backyard, and we preached to them. Now there was like eighty people. It wasn't like you know five hundred, but it was everybody in town, and they had a big barbecue and got them all together, and we preached and. Would you like to know? Would you like to have eternal life? All the hands go up. You say, "You didn't understand me." <laughs> and we just saw that over and over. So we we were in one place and we were leaving. Got into the car with his brother, little little bitty, the car, a little bitty German East German box with a lawnmower engine on it. <laughs> and we're and this guy comes running out, beating on the car. And his brother stops, and they start, blah, blah, blah. I don't understand Bulgarian, so back and forth. And Nick turns around, looks at Oscar, and he says, he wants to know, when are you going to come to my house and share this good news you've been sharing with everybody else? Well, we got an appointment over here in this other place, but maybe we could spare a little time. 
In Bulgarian, the term gospel meant sweet message. And here are people wanting to hear. That's what's going on here. These Gentiles heard about what Paul had set up in that synagogue and is spread out to the whole city out here, and they all come together to hear the word of God. But, verse 45, when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spoke against those things that were spoken by Paul. Now, who are the Jews? Verse 43, many Jews and religious proselytes. Here's the religious crowd. And they didn't want what the grace of God that Paul's preaching preached. So they contradict, it ain't true, and they blaspheme, it's, speak against it. Now notice what Paul does. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed what? He stood right up to them and said, here's what God's doing. In spite of all the persecution, in spite of all the opposition, they waxed bold. Folks, that's the kind of wax job you want to get. And they say, it was necessary that the word of God be first have been spoken to you. Why was it necessary? Because that was what the prophetic program called for. And Paul is demonstrating that the prophetic program isn't working anymore. So in order to do that, he goes in and preaches to the Jews. And what do they do? Instead of being the channel of God's blessings to the nations, they object. So it's necessary that the Word of God be spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. We preached it to you. You've demonstrated you don't want it. So you know what? Because you don't want God's truth, we're going to turn to the Gentiles. Now why is Paul turning to the Gentiles? Hold your hand here and come to Ephesians chapter 3. He's doing something that is categorically opposite of the prophetic program. He's doing something that's, con that's completely contrary to the Abrahamic covenant. In prophecy, up till this point in your Bible, salvation is to go to the Gentiles through the nation Israel. Now Paul's going to go to the Gentiles in spite of Israel. Well, where did he get the right to do that? Ephesians 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to do what? You were to give to you Gentiles. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. So Jesus Christ had communicated to the Apostle Paul a secret purpose, plan, and program. And Paul now is executing that secret purpose, plan, and program. That's why he says they waxed bold. They had to face down the religious opposition, the governmental opposition, the personal opposition of all of the nation Israel. And it took courage. Look at Romans chapter 15. Romans 15. You know, sometimes you, you read these passages back then, you just think, well, it's just business as usual. No, no. You go sometime over in, in, in your private reading, turn the boob tube off one night this week, and read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and see all the things Paul faced, perils here, perils there, perils there, and you say, whoa, it took some courage to do what he did. It took some boldness. It took some be strong. Where's that come from? That's what that armor is for. Romans 15, verse 15, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you, in some sort, as putting you in mind, because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Now, if you look back at verse 8, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. That's describing the ministry of Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
he came as a minister of the circumcision. He was Israel's Messiah. He came to fulfill Israel's prophetic program. Verse number 9, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Notice, as it is written. So what Christ in his earthly ministry is doing is carrying out that prophetic program that through Israel, his salvation and blessing would go to the nations. But then God changed the program. Now think about that. For from Adam, Abraham, Moses to Christ, there had been one program. And now God changed it. And he only told one guy. Do you understand why he had to have some boldness? Do you ever think, nobody's going to believe what we're preaching? You know, you just can't find anybody who believes this. You did. Isn't there anybody in your community, uh, uh, you know, has got, got as loose a screw as you do to believe something? Sure they do. You can find other people. They're out there. You just have to have the courage to proclaim it and face down the opposition because of it. First Thessalonians chapter number 2. When Paul went into Thessalonica in Acts 17, he stirred up a hornet's nest. And one of those verses that's really one of the marvelous ways the King James Bible says things, it says that, the, that after Paul preached there that, that a bunch of opposition arose and they went out and hired lewd men of the baser sort. <laughs> I love that. And they came and got a peace bomb, governmental injunction against Paul. Run about time, he can't come back. Lewd men of a baser sort. That doesn't sound like a highbrow kind of a crowd that's after Paul. First Thessalonians chapter 2. For yourselves, brethren, know our entering entrance in unto you, that it's not in vain. That even after that we, even after that we suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, he's thrown in jail, the Philippian jailer, and all that stuff. We were bold in our God to speak unto you, the gospel of God, with much contention. When he went into Thess they went into Thessalonica, Paul had just gotten out of jail in Philippi. Why was he put in jail in Philippi? Because of a bunch of false accusations. And they didn't just put him in jail. They put him in stocks and bonds and they beat them and they put him down in the cellar. After facing all of that, he goes to Thessalonica and in face of the lewd fellows of the baser sort, he preaches anyway. Now I read that and I think, wow, that takes courage. That's why Paul says what he does over here in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. You have to have that strength. Opposition, by the way, doesn't just come from the outward. You see how he says in verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Put on the whole armor of God, verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You ever seen the devil? I remember years ago, a guy was preaching. He said, I see the devil over here, and I see the devil. And a guy asked, he said, well, you see the devil. You know, he said the results of the devil's activity. Most of what you blame on the devil is your flesh. You know. You never saw the devil. There is an opposition in the unseen realm to what we do. That's what verse 12 is about. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's why in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in, in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication, for all saints and for me, that utterance might be given unto me, that I may watch, open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I'm an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. There he is in prison, chained to a Roman guard. And he says, I want to be able to speak courageously, boldly. I don't want to tremble at the opposition of the adversary. We should never tremble 
before him because our strength is in the Lord. Satan isn't happy. The reason he opposes what we do, we looked at the verse in Colossians 2, verse 15, talking about the cross work in the end of verse 14, his cross having spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in the cross. What Jesus Christ did at Calvary, come back with me to 1 Corinthians 2, is he literally put to open shame, held up to public open ridicule, embarrassment, the wise, proud, arrogant adversary. Ezekiel 28 talking about when Lucifer became Satan says, you're perfect from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. And the iniquity that was found in him, 1 Timothy says, was pride. He was proud of who he was. And in Ezekiel 28, it says, people are looking at him and admiring him. And they say, there's no secret. You're so wise. You're so beautiful. There's no secret can be kept from you. And that went to his head. And he thought, he loved that admiration. He loved that reputation. All God had to do to take the wise in his own craftiness was keep a secret. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 6, how about we speak the wisdom of God in a, in a, in, uh, among them, which we speak wisdom among them that, are, them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. The princes of this world are the principalities and powers, the spiritual wickedness in, heaven, in, in high places in Ephesians 6, verse 12. He's not just talking about the king of Tyrus. He's talking about the one who pulls the strings behind the scene. Satan and all of his minions don't know this. Their wisdom comes to a big, fat goose egg. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world in our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Why? Because it was at the cross that he goes in and spoils the princes. He goes in and literally takes away from the principalities and powers all the things they treasure. You know the expression, the spoils of war. You go in and you beat them, and then what belonged to them, what they now is yours because you're the conqueror. And he made an oath. He held him up to open. Do you like to be held up to open ridicule? Can you imagine the rage that filled the heart? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when God looks at Satan, and he says, I'm going to send the seed of a woman. I've made that dirt man. Made him lower than the angels. For the, he's, he's, he doesn't compare to you at all. He can't fly. He can't do anything you can do. I made him out of the dirt because I'm going to use him to reclaim that dirt back under my authority. And I'm going to send that seed to the woman. And you're going to bruise his heel. And he's going to crush your head. Whoa. That was God's promise to him. That's what took place. He struck at the heel of the Savior, the seed of the woman. He thought he had debilitated him. Now, having your heel hurt can hurt. We were with the leeches a couple, two weeks ago, and Brother Allen has difficulty walking. And a little bit before we got there, he got up out of his chair, and he said there was one peanut on the floor. And he stepped on it with his heel, and it knocked him down, caused his, the reaction caused him to, to fall over. 
one little penny. And you know how hard it is when you've got a heel bruise. Didn't mean it didn't hurt. But which would be better to lose, your heel or your head? Kids walked into church years ago and looked at me and said, Brother Rick, I can tell you how to lose 20 pounds of ugly fat just like that. I'm interested. Cut off your head. It's kind of inconvenient. That's why Satan rages. Now go back to Ephesians because I want to quit. That's why he rages. That's why we need courage in the conflict. Listen, folks, you're not called to just a bed of ease in life. And when there's conflict, whether it's with your flesh, whether it's with the world that you live in, the courage, the answer is in who God has made you in His Son. Satan is the one who drives the philosophy of the world system. He's the one who knows how to tempt your flesh to entice you. Listen, the victory is in who God made you in His Son. You'll be strong in the Lord. And by the way, when He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, when He describes the armor in verse 13, verse 14 and so forth, He's, we're gonna, when we study that, you're going to see what he's talking about. Put it on, like I put this coat on. He's talking about the armor is really you dress yourself like the Lord dresses himself when he's ready to, to go to battle. The, the, the metaphor comes out of Isaiah 50, 59. We'll see that. Literally what he's saying is put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Every piece of the armor is something that God has provided for your walk, but it's in Christ. So literally just putting on, it's just another way of saying put, put on Christ to go do battle. Let me just show you how Paul does it. Philippians chapter 1. I visited Char Charlotte in the hospital and we're sit I was sitting by her bed, and uh, we, we saw her last Thursday. <laughs> and now you know how this is. My wife and I go see somebody. They say, hi, Brother Rick. Come, Miss Cynthia. Sit down and talk to me. <laughs> so Cynthia played games with her, did all this stuff. You know, I'm sitting over in the corner talking to Kyle. Sort of irrelevant. But I sat and talked to Charlotte. I said, do you, know, you remember my favorite verse, my, my life verse? And she says, Yes. Well, what is it? <laughs> Philippians 121. I said, can you quote that verse with me? Why, yes. And we quoted, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But you know, to understand that verse, you've got to look at the verse before it. Because when it says, for me to live, he means something specific. Verse 21, verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that in with all boldness, with all courage, as always, so now also, Christ may be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ to be magnified in my body. And for me to die is for Christ to be magnified in my body. So those two things connect. Verse 20 tells you what to live and die. The issue is I want Christ to be mag. I want when people see me to see that he is the one that is treasured, that's cherished by life. Christ is our life. And when you magnify him, in your, when you make the choice that you're going to honor the Lord with your body, your life in him is going to be lived so that he is manifested in your body as the one that is your life. Not money, not possessions. You know what's going to happen with money and possessions? 
My dad used to say, money talks. Bye. <laughs> they vanish. Not religion. Because religion, you always fail. Not going to be fame, status. You know what happens, I, happens with fame and status? We read it in Ecclesiastes the other day. What happens? One generation comes, passes away. The next generation comes, passes away. And you know, if you go back two or three generations, you don't even know who your ancestors are. I thought about a guy at Emma's graduation yesterday was talking about that. And I thought, wow, that's a good point. How many of you know who your great-grandparents were? Now you say, well, I get on Ancestry.com and I look it up. But you still don't know who they were. You know what's going to happen if the Lord tarries and you have great-great-grandchildren? They may know where your grave is, but they won't know you. So if everything you did was to have fame, you know what happened? If that's your life, it's going to be a vapor. People say, well, I'm going to live for pleasure. If that's my life, is having a good time. You know what happens with pleasure? Eventually it turns to grief. At the end, it bites like an adder. Go back and read the prayer. The way of the transgressor's heart. The only real source of real life, real meaning, real lasting meaning is in Jesus Christ. That's why your Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. So the question is, do you have Him? And if you have Him, you have the real life, real living then you just need the courage to stand alone in Christ alone in your life, in your personal life. Make the choice to honor Christ with your body, with your mind, with your spirit. Live so that, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that you're not your own but you're bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your spirit and your soul and your body, which are His. You make the choice. I belong to Him. And when I make choices of life about where I'm going to go, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to think, how I'm going to use my body, I'm going to make the choice based upon who I really am in Christ. That's why the grace of God doesn't tell you, hey, it's just okay to go out and live any way you want to live. The grace of God teaches us that denying on God, that's not who we were are. But we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. The grace of God is a call to living the Christ life. Because that's the privilege. But that's going to take some courage. That's going to take some boldness. That's going to take some choice, making choices to cherish Him, His thinking, His attitudes above all the other, including your flesh, your desires, your insecurities. Your fears. It means in your church life. You're going to need to stand for the grace of God. Now what that means is, when I say that, there's two issues. There's the dispensational issue and then there's a doctrinal issue. You're going to need to be able to stand up for what we call mid-acts dispensationalism for understanding God's word rightly divided. It's not a popular thing today to be a dispensationalist, even less so to be a Pauline dispensationalist. Take some courage to stand up against that. The doctrines of grace, the sufficiency of who God's made you in Christ and not all the intervention, moving, extra-biblical stuff in your family, in your life, takes a bit of boldness to stand there and not be moved away and have it adulterated in your family, in your marriage. You put down the flag and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
and you have the courage to make that flag fly in the face of rebellion at home. On the job, your recreation life, your entertainment life, you value his viewpoint about life more than anything else. That's the courage to stand alone in Christ alone. That's be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That courage comes from the armor. And we're going to study in detail what that armor is. But that's what allows you to stand against the tricks and the schemes of the devil designed to destroy you. Standing in who you are in Christ, what a joy, what a privilege. That's who we're called to. And that's where the strength is. That's where the courage comes from, looking away from self and looking to him in that book. Father, we thank you today for your love and your grace to us in Christ Jesus. And I thank you for the privilege of working in, in ministry with people who understand these things. We have a heritage here at this assembly of great boldness from people for over a century. And I pray that we individually and as a group would pass that heritage forward for your glory in Christ's name. Amen.